Brothers, inshaAllah ta'ala, we're going to go into an example of another Sahabi of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And I'm sad because I feel like I can probably only squeeze in another two. I won't be able to do more than another two. But inshaAllah ta'ala, we'll try and make this as beneficial as we possibly can. <coughs> there was a companion of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam called Sa'id ibn Amir al-Jumahi. Sa'id ibn Amir al-Jumahi. Put your hand up if you heard this guy. Not this guy, sorry, this is Sahabi, radiallahu anhu. One. Who else? Sa'id ibn Amir al-Jumahi. Any sisters heard of him? Sa'id, brothers, the reason I'm asking this is because you need to know these people. Like we said, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa told us, you won't get to paradise unless you're from them or you follow them. Can you follow someone you don't know? Brothers, can you follow someone you don't know? These men from the Salaf, these are the Salaf, you have to know the Salaf, brothers. Sa'id ibn Amir al Jumahi, okay? Inshallah ta'ala. Before we proceed, I'm going to ask all the brothers to just come in. Everyone come in, come in closer, come in tighter. Brothers, you already know what it is. The sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is that we sit tighter together, yeah? Those in the back, come, come. Volunteer, no volunteer. Come in close, come in close. Barakallahu feekul. Okay, Sa'id ibn Amr al-Jumahi radiyallahu an was a very noble man. He was a very righteous companion of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He was not a man who liked the dunya. He had no care or concern for this worldly life. He used to even go and advise Umar radiyallahu an when Umar was khalifa to the He was the khalifa of the Muslim world. He took over after the Prophet died sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Abu Bakr took it and after Abu Bakr died, Umar radiyallahu an took it. And Umar was a very, very serious person. And not any guy could go and just chat to him. Like Sa'id ibn Amr al Jum'i would walk up to Umar and he would advise him and say, Listen, fear Allah in how you do what you do. Fear Allah in how you do what you do. And Umar loved this man. Umar loved him. He loved his religion. He loved his taqwa. He loved the way that this man was. So Umar decided to appoint him as the governor of Aleppo. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala rectify the affairs of the Muslims who are struggling in Syria and the rest of the Muslim world. Ameen. So when he came to Sa'id ibn Amr and Umar said, I want you to be the governor of Hims, the governor of Aleppo. He said, I'm not interested. He said, I have no interest for leadership or anything. I'm just trying to worship Allah and die. That's all I want to do. Umar looked at him and he said, you appointed me your leader. You people appointed me your leader. Rather, they didn't appoint him, sorry. As in Abu Bakr radiallahu anh, appointed him. But he said, I have been appointed as your leader. And I'm telling you this. And you're not listening to me. You're not obeying me. Of course, you have to obey the ruler. Even if, he's, if, even if the ruler is a tyrant, you have to obey him. But Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu anh, can we stop playing with the light sisters, please? Or brothers, whoever it is that's doing it. Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu anh, is not a tyrannical ruler. He's a just, righteous ruler, right? He's a just, righteous ruler. This is no problem, I'll take the position. I'll become the governor. Umar said, I'm going to pay you every month. He said, I don't need no money. He said, I make enough to survive. I make enough to live. Anything extra, keep it for the Muslims. I don't want it. So then once he was placed as the Khalifa of the Muslims, and he was doing his thing, sorry, the governor of the people of Aleppo. So once he was placed as the governor of Aleppo, Umar radiallahu anhu had a habit. He would go and he would go and check up on his governors to make sure they weren't cheating the people. Like, you know, nowadays you hear about this MP who used tax money to pay for his dog food. He used, well, I, you think I'm joking? This was on the news many years ago. MP paid tax money to pay for a swimming pool. He used tax money to pay for a swimming pool. So, you know, there was no cheating in Umar's time. Umar would go, he would check sometimes, he would find some of his companions, they got a nice house. Who are, who, he'll find some of his the companions who've been placed as a governor and they decorated the house. He would rip off the decoration from the wall and said, "Why what are you doing? This is not for you. You got the next life to enjoy this stuff in. Right now, you need to worship Allah correct and be humble. You had to serve the people, not to eat off the people." So Umar would go and check. So Umar went to Aleppo. He said, "I want to see what's up with Sa'id ibn Amr al Jumhi." So what did Umar do? Umar would go and ask the people, "What do you say about this man? How has he been behaving?" Sa'id. When he asked them about him, they said, we've got some complaints, O oh, leader of the believers. O oh, Amir al-Mu'mineen, Umar ibn Khattab, we have some complaints. They said, we've got four complaints about this man. We have what? We've got four complaints about this man. Umar said, go for it, talk to me, what's up? He said, the first complaint that we have 
is that this man, he comes out late. He comes out late. They're probably thinking he's sleeping and late, chilling with his family. and He's not handling the affairs of the Muslims until late in the morning. Just before Dhar time, he comes. So Umar called Sa'id. He said, Sa'id, answer. What's your response? They came with a claim. He said, O oh, Amir al muminin O oh, leader of the believers. He said, I am a man. I do not have a slave. I do everything in my house myself. I cook, I clean, I do it all. So I cook for my family in the morning because they're my family. They have rights on me. I can't. Otherwise, they, I'm going to oppress them. So I have to cook for them. And then I come out after I do that work. It's not because I'm sleeping or playing around or doing anything like that. So you can imagine how bad they felt. They're thinking, subhanAllah, we are thinking he's doing something else. The man, because he's poor, he's just cooking for his family. I said, okay, cool. What's, what's the next complaint? I said, the next complaint that we have about this man is that when we go to knock for him at night, when we need something at night time, something happens and we need it. We'll be knocking on his door and he doesn't respond. We go knock on the door and he doesn't answer. And we need him. He's our leader. He's placed there for that reason, right? Everyone says, okay, answer, Saeed. Why are you not helping the people at night? Saeed says, oh, Amir al muminin oh, leader of the believers. He said, I do not want to tell you about the things that I do in private. But I will say this. The daytime, I left it for the people. The nighttime is for Allah. The night time is for Allah. What was he doing? He was praying at night, worshipping Allah. Saying, whatever you need from me in the daytime, I'll do. I'll run around for you. But night time, I can't help you. I've got to save my own self from the hellfire. I need to pray to Allah. So no problem. What's the third complaint? People are shocked. thinking, subhanAllah. This guy actually is not as bad as we thought. The third thing they said, they said, we have another complaint. How's he going to answer this one? Eh? They said, every month, there's always one day in the month. He just doesn't even come out. He's just staying at home all day. He doesn't even come out. We need him. Slack him. One day. Umar said, Said, answer. What's your explanation for this? He says, O oh, Amir al Mu'minin, O oh, leader of the believers. He says, I am a man. I only own this one pair of clothes. I only wash it once a month. The day that I don't come out is the day when I wash it and I leave it to dry and I have nothing to wear. I have no clothes to come out with. The people are thinking, SubhanAllah. Shocked. Fourth complaint, what's the last one? Umar says, he said, okay, this one, how's he gonna answer this one? He says, sometimes we're talking to him as we're speaking to him. He just loses focus. His mind wanders off some way. His mind just travels. Umar says, you're not paying attention. Said, what's up? What's your explanation for this? Why are you losing concentration and focus? I sent you here to take care of the people. What's your response? He says, oh, Amir al muminin oh, leader of the believers. He says, the reason that my mind wanders and my concentration goes it's because there is something that happened many years ago. Before I became a Muslim, when I was in Mecca with the Kuffar, and whenever that incident comes to my mind, he said, I can't concentrate anymore. I can't focus anymore. That's why. And then he mentioned what the story was. He mentioned after the Battle of Badr, <coughs> And the Kuffar of Mecca, they lost that battle. They wanted to take revenge. So what they did was they grabbed one of the Muslims whose name was Khabib ibn Ali. Put your hand if you heard his name. Khabib ibn Ali. Again, only one person heard his name. Khabib ibn Ali, they captured him. And they said, we are going to kill this man as payback and revenge for the 70 Quraysh disbelievers who were killed in the Battle of Badr. So we're going to kill him. So they took him out to a place called Tan'im, where Masjid Aisha is, in Mecca. They had their swords, their knives, their blades ready. 
And they said, we are going to crucify this man. We're going to hang him up. Crucify him. And then we're going to kill him. Khabib ibn Adi was a man. He looked at them and he said, no problem, kill me. But there's one thing that I want to do before I die. What is it? He said, allow me to pray two raka'ah. I just want to pray two units of prayer to my Lord. After that, take my life. Sayyid ibn Amr said, I was there with them watching. He said, I never participated in killing this man. But I also, I never helped save him. I watched. He said, Habib, he started to pray. He started to pray. And his prayer was a prayer of relaxation. You'd never think that this man is scared. You'd never think he's about to be killed. And he didn't even pray long. Now, you know, imagine your last prayer. You go in, you'd stretch it out a lot. Forgive me for my sins, right? He said he kept his prayer short, sweet, just relaxed. He finished, he said, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. He turned back. And all of the people of Quraysh are standing there with their weapons, their swords, their blades, ready. He looked at them and he said, listen, I didn't make my prayer long because I didn't want any of you to think that I was scared of death. So I'm not scared of death. The only thing that I care about is the way I die. So I just wanted to pray those two units of prayer. He said, now come kill me. You know why he's like this? Because he's happy to meet Allah. But it doesn't, for these men it doesn't matter. He's thinking, when I die, but I'm, I'm going to meet Allah. Shaykh al-Bani, he said, you know the hadith of the Prophet said, anyone who is happy to meet Allah, Allah is happy to meet him. And anyone who hates to meet Allah, Allah hates to meet him. He said, why is it that people do not love to meet Allah? It's because they know they came with sins. They know they haven't come. Right now, bro, there were people that were just waiting to die. They were just waiting for the angel of death. Just going about their business, doing work, doing their things, serving their family, rights, whatnot. But they just can't wait to die. The Salaf couldn't wait to die. They just wanted to see Allah. Get me out of this place. I'm going Jannah. Can't commit suicide. I have to wait for the angel of death to come. When it comes to these men, it comes in a good way. So Khabib Nadi Radi Allah is day say, I'm ready. I'm ready. Go on. Waiting like a man. Saeed ibn Amr said, I'm watching this. They crucified him. <coughs> they hung him up. And they came with their blades and they started to slowly cut off parts of his body. Cut a limb off, cut a finger off, cut another body part. They started to cut his organs out. He's alive. Cut it out. They wanted to torture him. They wanted to torture him. And as they're torturing him and they're cutting his body parts off, his hands gone, arms gone, legs gone. Literally, he's just a... He's hanging up a mess of blood and bones and skin. They looked at him and they said, Khabib, would you not prefer Muhammad be in your place? Would you not prefer that you be free with your family? And he said, Muhammad be here? He said, by Allah, I would rather me here than the Prophet even being pricked by a thorn. He said, I don't even want a thorn to touch the messenger, let alone him be here. If, if you had to pick between the Prophet being pricked by a thorn and me here, I'll take this and save the Prophet from the thorn. Just before he made his last breath, the last breath, the final cut that killed him, Khabib spoke. He made a dua, a powerful dua. He said, Allahumma ahsihim adada. Oh Allah, count each and every single one of them. Allah, count them. One, two, three, all of them. Waqtulhum badada. Allah, kill all of them. 
yasruk minhum ahada allah don't even let one of them live don't even let one of them survive take them all and they killed him that dua came true by the way every single person who was there that day that harmed him they all died they were all killed allah took vengeance for him But the story here is about the young boy watching Sa'id ibn Amr al-Jum'ahi radiyallahu anhu. He's watching and this incident messed him up. He said, I started having nightmares, thinking, watching. Habib just seeing him. He said, time passed, I couldn't take it anymore. I went to the people who done it and I said, I'm free from you. I've got nothing to do with what you did with him that day. And I'm going to Medina to join Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa because he is the messenger of Allah and you people are punching shit and I've got nothing to do with you. So he left. Now coming back to the story, the complaints. He looked at Umar and the people and he said, the reason my mind wanders off when I remember that story is because I think to myself, that day I watched one of the companions being killed and I never helped him. I never saved him. I never saved him. I let him die. I never saved him. Well, like, there's so many lessons to take from the story, brothers and sisters. The first lesson is be a person who prays at night. Have a time for the people and a time for Allah. You make time for your friends, you make time for everyone. Why don't you make time for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? The more your time with the people increases, the more your time with Allah should increase. The other thing is, brothers, why have excessive clothes? And sisters, you need to pay attention to this as well. Like sisters have racks of clothes, majority of which you'll never wear. I'm not even going to come to you and say to you, have expensive, having expensive clothes is bad. I'm not going to say that. But what I'm going to say is, why have so many clothes? You know, for the last seven, eight months, Wallahi, I never thought I could do it. I'm a person who... The fitting of clothes is a fitting for me. Especially back in Jahiliya, bro. I actually had to convert an entire bedroom into a wardrobe. Because I had so many clothes. But Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen. I got rid of literally everything I own. Except for one suitcase. And for the last, since September, I've been living out of one suitcase. That's it. One suitcase. One suitcase. That's it. And recently, I came back from Mecca. And um, that suitcase... I was stuck in Jordan um, And I only had maybe two or three pairs With me, here So that's why I, you think I'm Maybe moving a bit trampy I've been wearing the same thing every day For the last two or three weeks My suitcase just came a couple of days ago So my wife's just washing all the clothes today So you're going to see me in my nice dog tomorrow The point I'm making inshallah ta'ala though Is that brothers, sisters You can live a minimalist lifestyle and I believe you should have good clothes. I don't believe you should look like a tramp. You should have good, good, good quality clothes. But, and spend money on them if you need to, as long as you don't go into extravagance. But don't have too much of it. <coughs> don't have too much. Have good clothes, but not too much of it. Not too much of it. You don't need that much. Wear good clothes regularly. Make sure they're good. But you don't need to have two, three wardrobes and clothes everywhere. A handful of outfits is enough. The other lesson that you take from here is what? And that's because you only had one garment, right? The other salam alaikum. The other lesson that we take from here what? Is serve your family's brothers. He was a man who would cook for his family, who would clean up. Some of us bro, we're grown men and our mums are still what? Cleaning our crap. Bro, our mums are still cleaning our filth, bro. But you're a man. You're a grown man, bro. And your mum's still doing the hoover. You're a grown man. And your mum's still washing the dishes. Put some work in your house, bro. <coughs> and of course, the benefit that we take here is whenever you see a Muslim, help him. When you see a Muslim in trouble, help him. When you see a Muslim in trouble, help him. And the reason I mention this story is because something happened on Friday. There was a bro- we, after the class, we done a class. One of the brothers was in the class. He got stabbed. And when he got stabbed, he got stabbed very badly. He had to have, do surgery on his arm. I saw something I never seen in my life. Never seen in my life. Ever in my life. The way I saw the brothers who were at that class, they went to save this brother. 
That's what that's just, a couple of the brothers saved his brother's life. And when they got in, into a safe place, because the people were running after him, they were trying to kill him. After they got him into a safe place, they started to patch up his wound, tend to his wound. And I swear by Allah, I'm not going into extremism or anything like that, I'm not comparing them to companions. But that day, when I looked at those brothers and the way that they did Wallahi, I said to myself, it's the first time I've seen anyone in my life close to how the Sahaba behaved. The way they were for their brothers. They, the brothers put their life at risk, some of them went forward, closed the door so the people couldn't get in. Imagine if someone smashed the door and came in, they would have stabbed them as well. They put their life at risk to save this brother's life. Pulled him in, holding the guys away, holding them out. They had a big, big fat machete kind of knife. They didn't know this guy. He's not their blood, he's not their cousin, he's not nothing. No relation to him, not even the same country. But they did it for Allah's sake, and I'm not gonna lie, I swear by Allah. My, I was shocked, I said, my, like these, these, all I could say to myself when I went back, I said, these brothers, they're real men, Allah, bad. I, just, I was just shocked at the way they handled everything. And they're young as well. The way they just handled everything. Saved him with Allah's permission, patched him up, called the ambulance, da da da. It just reminded me how the companions were, how they were concerned for their brothers. How they were concerned for their brothers. You know, there was a narration mentioned by Imam at Tahawi in his Mushkil al Athar, in which a man was inside of his grave. And he was, it was written for him to be lashed a hundred times. It was written for him to be lashed one hundred times. He begged and begged and begged and said, please don't lash me a hundred times. Until it was reduced to, re- reduced to one lash. The lash, when they lashed him, lashed him so hard that his entire grave, it burned into flames. The grave blew up into flames. After the lash, he gathered himself, he turned back and he asked, he said, what was the reason why I was lashed? What did I do that was so bad that you gave me this lash in the first place? They said two things. Number one, you prayed one salah and you did it without doing wudu. We didn't do wudu when you prayed that one prayer. The second thing is that there was a Muslim that was in trouble and needed help. You walked past and you never helped him. Brothers, helping the believers is a big thing, wallahi. Umar ibn, uh, Ali ibn Abi Talib, an, he left i'tikaf, which you're not allowed to leave in the masjid. Why? To help a Muslim that need the help. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, Wallahu fi awni al-abd ma kan al-abd fi awni akhi. Allah will aid you as long as you aid your brother. Allah will aid his slave as long as he aids his brother. That's why Sayyidina Amr Jum'ah, was upset. He was like, I didn't help him that day. And of course, he's not held to account because he wasn't even a Muslim. But this one, Islam does. We hold each other, and we build each other. We build each other, brothers. We're nothing like, let me ask a question. Can I wash my face? With one finger. I need all my fingers, right? Imagine me trying to wash my face like this. It doesn't work. But my hand, when it comes together, I wash my face. Brothers, we have to come together. Do you understand? All right? People become Muslim just because of the way we treat one another. Like, this is not normal. This is brother. This is... Like, brother, putting yourself at risk, putting your life at risk for someone, you don't know him. You work, work, work all month, save up your money, and you send your whole wage to Syria, or to Palestine, or to Kashmir, or to Somalia, to help people you never met in your life. Brothers, this is Iman. This is... Is Islamic Brotherhood. Ukhwatul Imaniya. Ukhwatul Imaniya. And I feel jealous in a good way though. In a good way, in a good way. When I started practicing, I never had brothers like you people. I used to. I never had brothers like you people. You lot got brothers. Most people my age asked them when they came to the deed, they came lonely, bro. Alone. I remember eight months until I had a righteous friend. And a lot of snakes in the grass come to you with a beard and they pretend to be loyal to you, bro, but they're not. 
And over the years, Allah allowed me to meet the brothers who today I call my friends. Over the years. And now, they are my friends, you get me? But you guys, and I can actually see you, there's a real brotherhood here. There's a real brotherhood here, Allah Tariq, mashallah. So make sure you keep it strong. And the way you keep it strong, is, is remember, it's based on Iman. The stronger your Iman, those brothers that Friday when they helped that brother and they tried to save his life with Allah's permission, which they did, they only were able to risk their own life for helping him with Allah's sake, for Allah's sake, because of their Iman. So I just looked at what that was, was a manifestation of their Iman. When I see brothers fighting, when I see brothers trying to kill each other, when I see brothers not talking, sisters not talking, talking crying about each other, know that that only happened because your Iman was weak. And how do you strengthen your Iman? You strengthen it through two things. Knowledge and righteous companionship. I have a question for you. From all of my videos online that you might have seen, which one has been the most life-changing one for you so far? Many people told me that it was the video when we gave that outside the Shisha Cafe. And I'll leave you with this. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, a time will come when holding on to my religion Holding on to Islam would become as difficult as holding on to charcoal. The charcoals that we smoke shisha with. The Prophet said, try and hold on to it. It burns you, let go of it. The Prophet said, that's what my religion will become like. Is it not like that today? Or maybe it was one of the other 1,000 plus videos that we have online. Whatever it was, I want to ask you a follow-up question. And that is, I want you to remember and record what life was like before you saw that video. When you were distant from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, when you're thinking of that and remembering that, I want you to be aware that there are many brothers and sisters who are still living life like that. They still haven't seen that one video that's going to help change their life. They haven't seen that one reminder that's going to touch them and bring them out from the darkness of sins to the brightness and the light and the happiness of guidance but that doesn't mean that there isn't hope for them they just need to come in contact with that kind of content online and that's why myself and my team are dedicating the next three months inshallah ta'ala to flooding the internet with as much content on tawheed and sunnah and reminders about allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as possible but the issue is that in order for us to reach those targets we're limited in terms of the resources that we have we need to hire more people in our media team we need to also buy new equipment now look i am going to ask you to support this financially but i'm not going to ask you for crazy numbers for us we don't need that kind of money we need little money because we have a team that really believes in this and the proof is in the pudding if you see what we've done over the last summer subhanallah you can see that the work it gets done that money goes where it deserves to be placed so i'm going to ask you inshallah ta'ala please inshallah ta'ala give it the link below and let's flood the internet with la ilaha illallah